Good morning. Welcome to worship at First United Methodist Church in Martinsville, Virginia on this, on this fifth Sunday of Epiphany. We are glad you are here and pray that you will find this service meaningful. This morning's call to worship is a responsive call to worship based on our lectionary readings for today from the Psalms, Isaiah, and the Gospel of Mark. Lord God, through Jesus, you opened the eyes of the blind, you healed the sick, and you fed the hungry. We give thanks and praise for your mercy and your love. Loving Father, by the Spirit, you restore strength to the weary and give hope to those who are in despair. We give you thanks and praise for your mercy and your love. You call us, Lord, to proclaim your deeds and your wonders to all people. You call us to worship and to serve you, that all may be made whole. You offer us a new life of righteousness. We give you thanks and praise for your mercy and your love. Make us worthy, O God, to receive all your gifts. Descend on us like the light of a new day. Give light to our souls and put your praise upon our lips. Amen. Praise you for he is my help. 
Will you join me in praying our opening prayer? Let us pray. Reconciling God, who holds the brokenness of the world in a vast embrace, restore us to your side, so that we may offer healing and hope beyond our walls. In the name of Jesus, amen. Good morning. I would like to ask for the attention of the children for our children's time. This morning, we have an Old Testament lesson that contains some verses that are very, very familiar. The verses say, even youths will faint and be weary and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Those words have been words of encouragement for people who are having a hard time for a long time. And in fact, they're so comforting and they're so empowering that uh, Jill and Jake will be singing a song later in the worship service with those words and with those images. So this morning, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what that image of eagle's wings is all about. I, I understand that when eagles have little baby eaglets and it's time for the little eaglets to learn how to fly, what the eagles will do is they will pick their, their, their eaglets up and they will fly up high with them and then drop them. And then as their, their little ones start falling, hopefully trying to spread their wings and fly for the first time, the eagles will soar beneath them and catch them on their wings and then drop them again and then catch them on their wings, always making sure that they never fall and get hurt. It's a wonderful image of God. God always catching us when we're about to fall. God always finding a way beneath us when we stumble, God always being there for us in times when we feel like our own strength is not enough. So when that happens to you, when you feel like you're having a really hard time, know that God is there to support you. Think about the eagle and the eagle's wings and remember that God wants to hold you up the same way. Thanks for being here this morning. As we prepare to hear God's word for us, let us pray. Gracious God, as we turn to your word for us, may the spirit of God rest upon us. Help us to be steadfast in our hearing in our speaking, in our believing, and in our living. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson this morning is found in the 40th chapter of Isaiah, beginning with the 21st verse. Here begin some of the most beautiful words in all of Scripture. If ever you are looking for a word of comfort, I encourage you to turn to the 40th chapter of Isaiah and continue through to the end of the book. The most beautiful words in scripture. I just really have found them to be very comforting in times of distress and hope that you will too. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught, makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows upon them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One? 
Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name, because he is great in strength, mighty in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning is found in the first chapter of Mark's gospel, beginning with the 29th verse. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went to a deserted place where he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. Recently in a catalog, I saw a sign that you could buy, that you could hang in your home. It read, home is where our stories begin. Well, home is certainly the place where we first come to understand who we are in relationship with other people. In a healthy home environment, we learn lessons about how to trust, how to forgive, how to get along with others how to share space, and lots of other lessons. A story is written, and to pay attention to that narrative is to find holiness in those stories, find holiness in those memories by recognizing that God is in them. Bishop Will Williman, in his book about baptism titled Remember Who You Are, writes that when he was a child, before he would leave the house, his mother would sometimes say to him, remember who you are. Remember that who you are outside the doors of this house reflects on who we are inside the doors of this house. We all live the storied narratives of home in all of our relationships in one way or another. Our Old Testament lesson this morning from Isaiah builds on an assumption that lies at the core of Israel's life together. The assumption that faith begins with memory. Where memory fails, the faith community is threatened. Many things can, can threaten the faithful memory of a community, political and social threats, enticements of ease and comfort, the lure of other competing gods, at the point where our Old Testament lesson picks up, destruction and exile have generated despair and chaos in the lives of the Israelites. Doubts about God's attention to Israel's future 
and God's power to control and direct that future threaten the very constitution of the community. The passage begins with a, a call for Israel to remember. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? There are people who had forgotten who they were, people with theological amnesia. The people of Israel had a long history, a story that they had told for generations, a story about how God had made a covenant with them, about how God had led them out of Egypt, about how God had led them through the sea, how the chariots and riders chasing them had gotten stuck in the mud so that the children of Israel could move forward toward the promised land where they were given new life. It was a powerful story, but they didn't know what was to come next. God had saved them. God had given them a new land and new life. That had been central to their identity, and yet it was in the past. Last time, it was the Egyptians who were the problem and the Red Sea also being in the middle of their path to the promised land. But now in Isaiah's time, the Babylonians are the problem. The congregation which heard Isaiah's sermon were people whose understanding of what it meant to be the covenant people had crumbled along with the destruction of Jerusalem. They were exiled from both the land and the notion that God would protect them. Everything they had known of God, they thought, was gone. They had been forced from their homes and scattered after the temple had been laid to waste. They had become refugees from the very land God had promised them. They longed for Jerusalem and they wept by the waters of Babylon. Landless, powerless, they even see their youths grow weary and fall exhausted. And so they conclude, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. They think that God has forgotten them. They think that they are hidden from God's sight. They could have concluded that the gods of Babylon were stronger than their God, and that their God perhaps didn't even exist. But their conclusion instead is that they are simply hidden from God, disregarded by God. Well, at times we may wonder the same thing. Wonder about God if the current state of the world is any indication of how almighty God actually is or how much God really cares. Why does God seem so far away sometimes? One interesting thing about this text is how it, it moves from God being described as the one who sits above the circle of the earth and creates and controls nations, bringing princes to naught and making the rulers of the earth as nothing. It's a transcendent picture of God, a God beyond or above the struggles and cares of humanity. But then God is described as one who numbers and names each of us, all of us, which tells us that nothing in all creation is missing or lost. In the same way that God is both fully human and fully divine, God is also both transcendent and imminent, both near and far. It is a lesson they won't fully understand. Later, God will send Jesus, who in this morning's gospel lesson heals Simon's mother-in-law. Remember that in the season after Epiphany, all of the readings have some thematic tie. The healing story from Mark's gospel isn't a story about God healing from above or beyond or on high, but of Jesus taking Simon's mother-in-law's law by the hand and lifting her up. It's an incarnational story, a story of love that is embodied. Love not expressed, love not felt, is difficult to trust. Theologically speaking, that is the reason for the incarnation. God knew of our human need for nearness. To the Israelites in crisis, God will send prophet after prophet, 
to remind Israel of who God is and who God was. Isaiah speaks that word, telling the Israelites that their real problem is that they have forgotten what they once knew very clearly. Babylon may seem strong and threatening, but Israel's forgetfulness represents the real threat to their community. And Isaiah's tough on them. Isaiah questions how the people can say that God ignores and disregards them. The implied statement here is that the problem does not lie with God, but with Israel itself. Given the evidence of Israel's own history and the evidence in creation itself, how can the people even question the attention and care of God? Isaiah says that this sovereign God is not only supremely powerful, sitting above the circle of the earth, the text says, but also the one who calls us all by name without one missing. So again, Isaiah asks the questions, have you not known? Have you not heard? And answers unequivocally, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. God's transcendence and imminence are at the end of this text, the word of hope for all who believe that God does not see the circumstances of their life, does not see their suffering, or perhaps disregards it. The crisis of the Babylonian exile has caused the people to forget their own story, the story of God's attentiveness and dependability, the story of God's love for them. Because they have forgotten, they are questioning the presence and power of God. But those who remember their history and believe in the God who has always kept his promises will be able to receive new strength and new life from their relationship with God. Remember who you are, Isaiah is saying. Remember who you are. They are nothing apart from God, and when they remember who they are, they will remember their history with God. In Isaiah's contemplation of God in relationship with humanity, we see a tapestry of good news that shows the way the exhausted, faint, powerless, and weary will renew their strength, mount up with wings like eagles, run without growing weary, and walk without fainting. In the midst of crisis, Hope may be hard to sustain, but if they depend upon God and wait and trust in their own story, their own story with God, they will receive the ability to meet the challenges and indeed to rise above them. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Let us affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come again to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now let us pray as our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power, and the glory forever. Amen. forth remembering your story with God. May it bring you renewed strength to share the gospel with boldness, with joy, and with thanksgiving. Amen. <laughs>